just recording on taxation of corporates. This is one of the topics that you're going to be doing as part of your block two syllabus. As you probably already know, for block two, we're going to be covering gross income, general deductions, taxation of corporates, and, general, and taxation of individuals. So in this lecture, it is going to be split into two parts and now we're going to look at the lecture objectives of the first part of this recording. The first thing that you have to be able to do after this lecture is to identify the special inclusions and specific deductions from a corporate's gross income. You also have to be able to identify the exempt, exempt income of a corporate. And lastly, you should be able to identify the prohibited deductions in terms of the taxable income of a corporate. So firstly, we are going to be starting with our specific inclusions. So as we are going to be calculating our gross income, this is in general the formula. First, you have your gross income. This is the one that we have learned in our gross income lecture, whereby it tells us what should be included and excluded from gross income. And if you remember the definition, it is amounts received by or accrued to a person in the year of assessment from your source within Zimbabwe, excluding those of a capital nature. So this is the first part where you start when you're calculating the income of a corporate we are also going to include the specific inclusions so specific inclusions basically are those which are not covered by the general formula and then the act comes through section 8 telling you the exact things that should be included over and above the general we are then going to exclude any exemptions so for exemptions this is income which it means the gross income definition, either through the general formula or through specific deductions. And then the act then comes and says, for this one, we are going to give you relief. It is going to be exempt from being taxed. And then lastly, we will then deduct the allowable deductions. So this, these can be from the general deduction formula or from specific deductions that we are going to learn just now. So for the rates of tax that are available for any corporate, first of all, we have manufacturing companies exporting in excess of 50% of their output. They are taxed at a rate of 20%. We have pension funds which are exempt from being taxed. So I'm sure you can try to get into the commissioner's head when these provisions came out. Pension funds are there for the betterment of the society. And if you remember, when we learned the administrative framework, we know that taxes can be used to do certain things within the economy. And in this case, pension funds are exempt. And then our normal companies and trusts, these are taxed at a rate of 25%. Our foreign dividends are tax at the rate of 20%. So please note, if, if we go back to our gross income, there are things which are not from a source within Zimbabwe, which will be deemed to be from a source within Zimbabwe as per section 12. So if a resident earns, div earns dividends from, a, for example, a South African company or a United States company, these dividends should be taxed in Zimbabwe. However, the legislation then comes through and says they should be taxed at a different rate of 20%. So you'll find that when you're not um, being examined, you're, when you're doing your calculation or even when you're discussing, remember that foreign dividends are taxed separately at their own rate. So you tax the rest of the income at 25%, then you tax your foreign dividends at 20%, and when you join this, you get the taxable income of the taxpayer. We also have an AIDS levy of 3%. This is taxed over and above the normal tax that someone is taxed. But these are levied on normal companies, trusts, and employees. It doesn't apply to the 
rest of the taxpayers. That means for normal companies, the effective rate, if you include the 3% in there, the effective tax rate is 25.75. We also have special mining lease operations. These are taxed at the ratio of 15%. And as I was saying earlier, the taxes can be used to manipulate certain things in the economy. And I'm sure you agree that the government has been trying to encourage mining, mining by small scale farmers, large scale farmers. So because of that, they then give lower tax rates in order to encourage more performance in those sectors. Now we're going to look at the specific inclusions. So I'm not going to look at all the specific inclusions. These have been dealt with in your module. You have to go in there and look at all of them. I'm just going to look at the most common ones, if I could say. So first of all, we're going to look at trading stock. So for trading stock, the taxman and the interest principles meet and tally in this case. So your closing stock, that is your stock at year end, is included in your gross income. So if you try to think about it, the logic behind it from my own thinking, when you bought this stock, it is expenditure for the purposes of trade. So you were allowed a deduction, but you didn't sell this stock. So it's like you just got a deduction, but you didn't get the corresponding income. So that could be the rationale of including it um, into the gross as part of gross income. You will also find that stocks that have been taken for domestic purposes and donated stock and all the other stock that is disposed through if i can say our not so normal ways these should be included in gross income and if you go to the second schedule and if you also go into the module you will see the different values at which you should include um, your these different stocks and the different circumstances so what you then should know when you go to the second schedule you have to know that remember we are mainly focusing on tax planning so when we are in tax planning you have to ask yourself what is the best value for my taxpayer at which value should i add this closing stock into the gross income should i use the market value should i use the closing the market value the cost or any other value that have been provided by the second schedule so ideally because we are being we are including it in gross income it will be best for them for the taxpayer to include the one with the least value and usually that is the cost unless maybe the stock is obsolete and the market value is lesser another special inclusion will be annuities so annuities in general are regarded as um, capital in nature that's why the need for there to be a special inclusion so some of the examples of annuities that are there are purchased annuities so for purchased annuities this is whereby you go to for example old mutual you tell them that after i retire i want to be earning an amount of 200 dollars every month so they will tell you how much to contribute and afterwards they will then pay you back that 200 bucks that you would have paid for. So when you get paid this amount, especially with purchased annuities, I'm sure you can agree with me that there is a capital portion and a profit option to it. Because remember, you actually paid for this annuity. So at the end of the day, when you are now including gross in, in gross income, you have to only include if I could say the profit element of it and exclude the capital because remember from our general gross income definition we should not include amounts which are of a capital nature. There are also annuities by gift or legacy and these um, example of one will be an annuity for a widow. For example if um, 
uh, their husband was working like for Barclays and spend and then they die and then now they're receiving and I knew it and they're receiving their husband's pension if I could say those are the ones which are by gift or legacy and they're generally included in gross income and there are more examples in the module of the different types of annuities that are there which should be included in gross income so the trick when it comes to comprehension about annuities you have to be able to tell that there has been an annuity and you need to know the characteristics of an annuity so first of all we could say they are repetitive in nature and there is someone who has the obligation to pay you those re uh, repeated installments so go into your module and look at the other examples of the annuities and how they are treated we also have subsidies and grants. For example, the government has um, certain sectors which it wants. For example, in agriculture, people get subsidies and grants. Um, if you remember the farm mechanization program, that can be some sort of a subsidy or a grant. However, for these subsidies, you have to include those which are revenue in nature. Um, those which are capital in nature should not be included because of our general gross income gross income formula so you only include the ones that are revenue in nature lastly exchange gains so if there are certain exchange gains which happen previously before the introduction of the bond note when it was just mainly the US dollar if you would buy something from South Africa or you had a data or a credit at them because of certain moves in exchange rates you realize that sometimes you have an exchange gain not be not because the person is going to pay you more or whatever but because the exchange rate has just shifted so with regards to exchange gains you're only allowed to include in gross income when they are realized i'm sure you agree with me that if they not have been realized then they would not have been received or accrued yet so if it's just a if it's just a gain on paper, we haven't accrued it or received it. But the moment maybe that creditor pays or we pay that data, then it then becomes realized. Now we're going to look at exemptions. So as I explained earlier, exemptions is whereby something has been included in gross income. So make sure you get this very correctly. For there to be an exemption, it has to be included in gross income in the first place. There cannot be an exemption if it doesn't meet the gross income definition or if it's not a specific inclusion. So a, an exemption only arises after that has happened. So be careful when you are discussing um, your answers to say there are no income tax consequences because something is exempt there are consequences because it has been first included and now it is being excluded so some of the um, examples of whereby there is an exemption is there are certain companies which are specifically excluded from paying tax so these are for your statutory corporations your local your local authorities those ones are exempt from paying tax however you need to make sure that you know the difference between the statutory corporations and the parastatals so the statutory corporations are those which are enacted by an act of law and then a parastatal is a business whereby the government has a larger stake for example CESA. So for a company like this, it has to actually pay income tax. But for a statutory corporation, it is not required to do so. There are also dividends from local companies which are exempt. And these exemptions can be found in section 14 is read with the third schedule. So with dividends, if you receive a dividend from Econet, from Masimba Construction, from Simbisa, these are dividends from local companies which should be exempt. So 
if you agree, I'm sure you agree with me that these meet the gross income definition and would have been included in gross income in the first place. So now an exemption then comes through. There's also income from which residence tax has been withheld. So you will find that there are certain income, for example, interest in in a fixed deposit from First Capital Bank or something like that. If you get income from those, First Capital Bank is required to withhold a certain percentage. If you visit, if you go to I think section 23, this is where these withholding taxes are, and you're also going to learn them in the second semester. If these these withholding taxes are regarded as the final taxes. That means that you will not be taxed any further other than the withholding tax that the company is going to withhold. So these are also exempt. And then there are also, if I could say, other receipts and accruals which arise for different companies. For example, the RRBZ. Um, those are exempt. For building societies, those are also exempt. And then lastly, but not least, but also quite obviously, non-profit organizations. So we have our NGOs, our um, uh, what, these councils, which are not for profit. These, oh, these guys also are exempt from paying tax for obvious reasons because we, we want to help the community as much as we can and giving these guys an incentive from exempting them from paying tax will encourage more activity in that area. Now we're going to look at the specific deductions. So again, I'm not going to look at all the specific deductions, but I'm just going to look at the few and explain uh, a few for you. The onus is on you to go into your module and look at the other ones also in your legislation, look at all the specific deductions that are there so that when you see something in your exam, you can be able to comprehend that there is a provision for this and you can apply it appropriately. So these specific deductions are found in section 15.2 um, of the Income Tax Act. So I'll start with repairs. So repairs are allowed as deduction. So if your motor vehicle is damaged and you fix it, it is allowed as a deduction. However, the tricky part around repairs is the difference between repairs and improvements. So you'll find that sometimes we confuse the two. So repair is basically restoring something to where it previously was. Although when you now repair it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same material. So for example, if uh, we had a cement floor and we replace it with a ceramic tiles, that doesn't mean there has been an improvement. That is a repair. Just because we have now used ceramic tiles doesn't mean it is an improvement. It is simply a repair. So improvements are capital in nature and repairs are revenue in nature. So you have, we have to be careful around repairs and improvements. So for example, if we remove a leaking tin roof with, I don't know what they call those other fancy tiles, then it doesn't mean we have improved the building. It is simply a repair. We also have bed dates. For, so the commissioner allows you to deduct bed dates, but there are certain requirements for you to meet before you'll be able to deduct bed dates. So firstly, these um, the income should have been included in gross income in any previous assessment. So obviously for it to be a bad debt and for you to be able to want to deduct it is because at some point in time you had included it in your gross income. And then secondly, it should have become due and payable. I'm sure you agree that it can't be a bad debt if it's not yet due and payable. Um, just because someone missed one payment doesn't mean now that it's a bad debt, especially when they have more payments to make. 
And then lastly, you have to be able to prove to the commissioner that this debt has indeed become bad. So how can you prove this? So ideally, I would say it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. If, for example, um, <clears throat> you had a customer at the beginning of the year and they, and they owed you something which was, they were supposed to pay in December and then they die in June, that can be a reasonable basis for you to say it can be proven that it, it, they have become bad. But if, for example, this is a debt which is just one year old, the commissioner might decline and they can say you haven't really proven. Have you done everything that you can to try and recover this money so that we can determine that it has really become bad? So ideally, if maybe a debt is three years three years old or something like that, then we can assume that it has become bad. So these are the main requirements that should have been met before you deduct. So even if you're doing a calculation, ask yourself, has this date met all the requirements? The scenario will try to be as clear as possible, although not giving it away, that something is indeed bad. Then we also have pension and medical aid contributions. So if an employer pays for their employees' pension and medical aid contributions, these are allowed as a deduction. I'm sure you can agree that they are indeed for the purposes of trade. And with regards to pensions, you are only allowed a maximum of 5,400 per year per employee. So that is the maximum you are allowed to deduct per employee. So if you pay 6,000, worth of pension contributions for the CEO or something like that, the, the remaining 600, which is over and above the limit, will not be allowed as a deduction. And then we also have payments to former employees, whereby someone is retired due to age, ill health, or injury, then if you decide to pay that person, you are allowed a deduction to a maximum of 500. And if maybe it's their dependents, maybe this person has died and now you want to give the wife or the children or something like that, the maximum deduction is 200 per beneficiary. Then we also have bursaries and scholarships. So you find that certain companies pay, give out bursaries and scholarships um, maybe for their employees or for people who they're, they're not even related to. So for bursaries and scholarships, you are allowed a deduction to the extent that it relates to the taxpayer's trade. So for example, if CAA gives out a bursary for someone who's going to do CTA, then that is in connection with their trade, it can be allowed as a deduction. But if they pay for someone maybe to do engineering, that has nothing to do with CAH trade. So it might, it won't be allowed as a deduction actually. So this one, the, the deductions are only prohibited if it's a sole trader to the owner of the company, the spouse or near relative of both these guys. They won't be allowed a deduction on that. Because if you can agree with me, it can be sort of an avoidance for someone who just wants to pay school fees for their child. And then now they're going to deem it as a scholarship. And then if it's a company, the directors and their spouses and near relatives of their spouse and the directors themselves, they are not allowed as a deduction. As a deduction. However, if the director is fully employed, that means he's an executive director and he owns less than 5% of the company, then if you give a scholarship to a near relative of his, a deduction will be allowed. We also have experiments and research. So if a company does some research and experiments for the purposes of their trade. So this also has to be related to their trade. It will be allowed as a deduction, but it is a, if it has nothing to do with them, then it won't be allowed. And if this is also allowed to the extent that it is revenue in nature. So if it is capital in nature, then you have to go and seek for capital allowances, which we're going to learn later 
um, in part two of this lecture, those are the ones that you will be allowed. But with regards to a normal deduction, it won't be allowed because I'm sure from our gross income definition that we already know, it is capital in nature. Then more specific deductions, we also have donations. So in donations, we have section 15 to R up to R5 or R6, if I'm not mistaken. So with regards to donations, um, there are certain limits that are there and there are certain restrictions that are there. So for example, section 15 R1, it gives you allowance to donate to any ministry of health. So in any, anything to do with the ministry of health, if I can say. So the maximum for those donations which can be allowed as a deduction is 100,000. So now, Section 15R1 then gives you restrictions on what you can be allowed as a deduction for. So if you donate to buy medical equipment, you will be allowed a deduction. If you donate to expand the hospital, you will also be allowed a deduction. And I, if you buy drugs, you will be allowed a deduction. So if you then donate to pay doctors and nurses, you won't be allowed as a deduction because it is not specified. And then if we move on to section 15, if it's not R2 or R3, if I'm not mistaken, whereby you donate to some to an institution governed by the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, you will find that for the Ministry of Higher and Tertiary Education, you are not restricted as to what you are donating for. So if you donate for the salaries of lecturers, you are allowed a deduction. But if we then go down to the next section which talks about the Ministry of Education, which mainly deals with primary schools and stuff like that, you, you are also restricted to certain things you should donate for, for example, um, educational equipment. So if you dis donate a TV with DSTV for learning purposes, you will be allowed as a deduction because it is for educational purposes. But for that, if you also donate for you to pay teachers, you might not be allowed as a deduction. So now I have to go through all those sections and notice the restrictions that are there and the limits that are there because when you now see something in the scenario, you want to be able to say, for this one, I can don't, I can deduct up to 200,000 or 100,000, and what can I be allowed a deduction for? Then subscriptions, professional subscriptions, you are allowed to deduct them. So for example, if you pay ICAS, you are allowed a deduction. If you pay Institute of Chartered Secretaries, I think, you are allowed a deduction as well. Pre-incorporation expenses, those that you would have in, um, incurred prior to prior to commencement of trade, you are allowed it the deduction, um, obviously due to certain restrictions. So it says you can only be allowed a deduction provided if you had already commenced trade, these would be allowed would also be allowed as a deduction. Opening stock is also allowed as a deduction, also supporting the IFRS principles. Um, if, if you follow back to the trading stock that we just did, closing stock is in gross income, and then the following year, you deduct it again. I'm sure if you really think about it, it makes sense. Conventions and trade missions, you are also allowed a deduction for attending conventions. However, it has limits to 2,500 only for one convention in any particular year of assessment. And then we also have share option schemes. So if a company incurs, incurs an expense for an approved, for giving shares to its employee in an approved, it actually says approved share option scheme, you are allowed a deduction. So if it is something which is not approved, and usually this approval is by the commission, of course we are talking about tax you can be allowed a deduction. Um, we're going to pause now and then we'll continue with part one.